Okay, so I'll try and keep this short, and if you will forgive me, this is a slightly rambling speech, so this was uh, rather hash happy put together earlier today. Uh, but first, I want to clarify my position, so, and I do prefer to use the word agnostic rather than atheist. So I may not be a man of faith, so I doubt that there is some all-powerful, omnipotent being out there, sort of lording it all over us little people. Uh, but I would prefer to keep an open mind, after all, you can never be too careful these days. But rather than be drawn into a debate about the existence of God or gods, depending on your outlook, uh, let's focus on with the question at hand, which is, of course, the actual benefits of religion itself. Uh, so how about a brief history lesson to start things off? So I understand that religion has a rather dark history, and as has been mentioned, the Spanish Inquisition, you can talk about the Crusades, all these sort of things. It does paint quite an uh, unpleasant picture of its past. But let us also not forget that some of the gravest crimes of the 20th century were caused not by religion, but by those who would seek to disown a belief in God, those who were secular and atheist. So religion is, in the words of Karl Marx, and, and obviously this was carried through the Bolsheviks and Joseph Stalin, it was a sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. So in 1924, Stalin created the League of Militant Atheists, whose purpose was to shut down organised religion in Soviet Russia. This, of course, led to 40,000 churches being desecrated, 25,000 mosques being demolished, and all turned into cinemas and clubs and things like this. I'm sure those out here who don't believe in God would see that or see as a very merry thing. But let's not forget that, uh, given the conservative estimate, Stalin also killed 9.8 million people of his own uh, during, these, during his years in power of 1926 or 1937 alone. So, and he was, of course, not a man of God. So refraining, though, from going down this path of numerous negative examples, let's uh, return to the slightly upbeat world of the benefits of religion. So first, uh, let's start with charity. We all like a good bit of charity. And, of course, it was in 19th century Britain, it was the church and not the state, which laid the foundations for a culture of charitable giving. Yet in the modern world, faith-based charities have been seen as self-interested. They, they actively discriminate against non-believers. Uh, I'm sure that some do, uh, just as some charities are, of course, a mere hoax to hide an individual's wealth for the purposes of tax evasion. These are rare cases, though, and because of past mistakes, faith-based charities are now some of the most scrutinised bodies in the UK. They're some of the most responsible and some of the most accountable. The same can't be said for those who avoid tax. So faith-based charities, especially in the international context, can boldly go where no secular charity dare not. So, for example, let us take Islamic Relief Worldwide. It, uh, this organisation goes into some of the most poorest and deprived regions in the world, and due to religious dif uh, differences and just a general lack of trust in outsiders, these communities who are in dire need of help, they don't open up their doors to outsiders very often, but because of a shared belief and because of a shared religion, they do allow them to come in for mutual, sort of mutual benefit. <coughs> And also, just quickly, uh, Arthur Brooks of the Hoover Institution of Stanford University has carried out numerous research into this, and in America at least, uh, it was that secular charities receive more money from believers, from those of faith, than they do from non-believers. So that can kind of be religion and those of religion sort of transforming the boundaries between a belief in God and not a belief in God. But of course, uh, the financial arguments of home religion should not be the focus of this debate. Rather, what religion is, at its most simple form, is a way of life. It offers moral guidance on how to be a good person. And yes, okay, this moral guidance has seeped into every section of society. I'm not saying that all atheists are bad people and all religious people are good people. That's obviously not the case. But the basic fact of you treat others as you wish to be treated yourself, and that message came historically from religion. It's come from those who have faith, who those do believe, do believe in goodness. So the personal benefits, I'm sure my fellow panellists over here will talk about. So I'm um, being, obviously, oh, thank you very much. So, so they'll go through that, I'm sure. Uh, but I have painted a rather rosy picture of religion, and I don't pretend that some aspects of it are outdated. Yet the signs of the slow march of progress are there, even in a naturally conservative organisation, say, such as the Catholic Church. I use this as an example as, on May the 8th, a gathering of over a thousand Catholics took place in Dublin, and this was a forum in which to discuss the future of the Catholic Church and the age profile of those who are arguing for progress, for change, for the Church to actually catch up with the rest of society. Their main profiles are priests and nuns in their 50s and 60s. 
And if this, ge this generation, these people can call for change and call for progress, then of course the younger generations will too. And as in every conservative institution, as the young come through with their new, new more liberal values, of course it will change and things will get better. So religion you know, affects all aspects of our lives. It will adapt, it will change, and it will progress. It will just, of course, take a little bit longer. But of millions and millions of people all over the world believing in it, if it was to disappear overnight, it would be sheer anarchy. Thank you very much. Thank you.